Hello folks, this is Tom from anti-proton.com. I've been away for a little while because I've moved into my in-laws house as I wait to buy a house. I'm trying to buy a house and for financial purposes it was very beneficial for me to move in here while I waited. Um, the upside to that is the financial part. The downside to that is that I'm kind of stuck in somebody else's house. So it makes videos in nuclear physics a little weird. Um, this video is going to discuss the ability of a Geiger counter to be used for food testing or just testing in general for, for what determining its minimum detection capabilities, that sort of thing. A uh, Geiger counter like this guy right here. See? Oh no, the radiation's made by hand wood. No, actually it's a wooden model. But anyway, um, I have all the numbers and data right here. I have Geiger counters galore. And I've already done the test, and I'm going to give you the results. Let me give you a couple quick disclaimers. Um, I'm not a physicist. I, I say this every time. Everybody should know this by now, by now. But just in case you don't, I'm not a physicist. I am not a scientist per se. Well, I mean, I you know do computer science. I have a degree in computer science. That's what I do professionally. But um, that's not the same as a physical scientist, like a, a chemistry person or a, um, uh, a geologist or whatnot. So... I don't have those credentials. I've you know taken the classes and so on in, in college and in high school and both of them, so I'm not completely ignorant of the subject. And I've devoted nearly my entire life to learning about those subjects, and I am going to be going back to college to become a non-layperson, a professional of those subjects. But for right this moment, I am not. I am a layperson. So there's my little disclaimer for you. So I don't want anybody coming back and claiming that I'm attempting to assert something when I'm obviously saying right now that I am a layperson, so <laughs> can't be more plain than that. All right, so basically put, what is the minimum detection capability of a Geiger counter? And I chose this guy right here. The um, here, you can pry your fingers off, please. This is the uh, Inspector EXP Plus Geiger counter. I took off the nice rubber housing I usually have around it and put it on my CRM100. Um, this little guy right here. Uh, it's a beautiful little Geiger counter, works like a champ, but what's most important about it is that it has this tube. And I'm just kind of sitting here on the on the floor to the basement. This isn't my usual workplace, but as I said, I've moved into a new place. This is the LND 7317 tube. It's one of the most sensitive tubes that you can get. It's a pancake Geiger Mueller tube. Um, it's absolutely a beautiful detector. I love it. It has the exact same tube that you find inside of the regular inspector and the inspector USB and the PRM 9000. Um, and there's other brands out there that actually have these same detectors in them too. Very, very popular one. It's very, very, uh, very, very sensitive, tremendously sensitive. So I was curious. I'm always fighting people when they say, can this be used for food detection? I say no. And I thought to myself, well, wait a second. There's a very particular reason that this could never be used for food detection. But how can I make the claim that it couldn't detect radiation in food at a particular level without absolutely testing it. I mean, I've kind of tested it before and seen it, but I mean, without more of a, a semi-formal test, obviously. So I, I did that. I wanted to see. And I'll explain my steps and what I did in just a minute. Um, <clears throat> just to let you know, the main reason this cannot be used for food no matter what, even if it can detect low, level, low, low levels of cesium-137 in food, is that you wouldn't be able to determine whether or not the radioactivity you were detecting was cesium-137 or, or natural potassium or anything else. Uh, so, for example, uh, Brazil nuts and b bananas and potatoes and things would all show up as radioactive, but they wouldn't be, well, they could potentially have cesium-137 in them. You could look at them, see they're radioactive, recognize that they normally have potassium in them, and then falsely think that they're safe even though they're not. Or you could, uh, so you, that would be a, uh, a false negative, or you could have a false positive. Um, realistically speaking, this kind of device can never be used for radiation detection in food for any trace radiation type scenario because it just doesn't know what's in it. And there's no, I've heard weird stories about ideas of how you could use one to do it, but you can't. It cannot be done. And not only do I say that, um, I have actually have been told that directly by people who do have PhDs in nuclear physics. But regardless, I won't make the claim for them, I guess. I'll just make the claim for myself. I will say that it cannot be done. Um, <clears throat> but basically, put you need a device like this to determine uh, what's actually in the food. This is a gamma spectroscopic dosimeter. It's a gamma spectrometer. It can actually tell you what isotopes are in food. I also tested it just on the side for giggles. Um, things like the scintillation counter are incredibly sensitive, but again, it can't actually be used for this purpose because 
when it's being used as a scintillation counter, just like the Geiger counter, it's only measuring counts, not the actual energy involved. So I have all the data right here. Uh, the first thing I want to uh, show you was what I, the source that I used. I used a 37 kilobeck roll cesium-137 source. Here it is. Oh, the radiation has darkened my hand. No, it's another one of those little models. Um, we put that down there. Um, I can hold it with my hand. I was just doing that for fun. And notice the, the spectrometer is already going off the wall over it. And the inspector sees it just fine. The scintillation counter has gone hard over. So, yeah. So let's cut that up a notch. Um, there, I flipped its range setting up a little bit. All the Geiger counters and scintillation counters are going crazy. What I did was I took a 3.7 kilobeck roll sample that has a 95% uh, confidence and uh, that's against a NIST uh, traceable mixed gamma source and I compared it to this and determined the, a the activity of this to approximately the same confidence interval. Uh, from that what I did, uh, well let me show you kind of how the um, test went. I, t I imagined what would happen if you took this detector and put it here and exactly 10 centimeters away you put a food substance that was a near point source. That's the the flaw in the whole thing is that it had to be a near point source because a um, a, a homogeneously uh, um, a homogeneous point source um, is very easy to calculate whereas a, a large box of food that has you know cesium randomly distributed through it is incredibly complicated to do with any sort of Ma uh, simple mathematical testing. That right there is the immediate flaw in the entire thing, obviously. So uh, this is basically a test of the absolute perfect case scenario with a small object that is a reasonably uniform uh, distribution of cesium-137 in it. And from a 10 centimeters distance, that's about right here, what I did was I calculated of uh, uh, for all of the activity coming out of the source what percentage would be hitting this detector. And um, here is a, a graphical model of what I'm kind of showing you. All right, so from the model, you get the idea all the photons spread out and um, basically put, they hit this detector at a particular percentage. From there, I took the source, the 37 kilobeck roll source, and put it a distance away. I had a whole rig set up here so it would you know sit up nicely and work and everything. I'm just kind of showing you right now. And I expanded this far enough away that I could calculate the same percentage the same percentage of the um, total emissions hitting this such that it equaled a much lesser activity than what is currently coming out of this guy right here. And what I did was I calculated the uh, change in activity with respect to time. I calculated the change in intensity with respect to distance. I calculated the change in acti uh, activity um, as a result of um, the branching rate of the actual isotope, which is 85.1% at 661.66 keV photons. I took into account all of the math and every square inch of it. Um, here's a graphical model of what it looks like once I expand it out. So I have a model now for what's happening when the food would be hitting the um, detector. And I have then from that point actually created an increased distance, which models that perfectly to decrease the actual activity of the um, source in a simulated sort of fashion. So I'm using distance to, to uh, attenuate the gammas such that it appears that I have a lower activity source than I actually do. And I'll put my math in the details information, and I'll also put the links to the FDA website where I got the uh, two activities that I decided to use. For cesium-134 and cesium-137, in fact, let me, um, before I do that, let me um, pull that up on my phone here. I have a Galaxy Note 3. Yay! It's an awesome phone. It's cool. 
advertisement for Samsung. Advertisement for Samsung. Well, not really, though. They didn't pay me. I wish they had that. That'd be awesome. But anyway, uh, let's see. FDA site. Of course, I guess I'd be showing it a little better if they had, right? Um, basically put, this is the FDA, FDA site, and they allow you to show their stuff. Not only is it covered under fair use, but they actually let you show their stuff. So, you know, who cares? Um, season 134 and Season 137 for food. This is the um, a level of concern. This is where they start to spaz a little bit if you were to actually have food that was this high. 370 Beck rolls per kilogram is their level of concern. Now, I so I figured out, I'm not saying that that, that should be the, your level of concern for food. That's just where I decided to um, test as my minimum level. For my next one up, I looked at the CC-137 uh, and CC-134 for um, uh, uh, derived intervention levels. This is pretty much where they decide to do legal things if you happen to have food that's this hot. And 1,200 becquerels per kilogram is exactly the limit that I went for. So my, my point is not to argue whether those are good limits or not, and whether or not to say that, that that's exactly the complete interpretation of what those mean or anything like that. Um, wow, everything turned kind of orange. But the point of that was to come up with two activities that were not just completely random. I figured it would be kind of neat to use those specific levels. And uh, to pull back here, like I said, this is sort of an informal test. Um, oops, that's my some of my math. Here we go. Actually, this is already on the right page. Uh, to simulate the lower activity, I used a distance of 980.209 millimeters. And to simulate the higher, the 1200 Becquerel per kilogram, I used a uh, 544.288 millimeter distance. Quite interesting. So the results, now they're all cleaned up, are as follows. Um, for my background, I came up with, well, here are the numbers. You can freeze frame and look at them yourself and do the math if you like. So I'm just going to sh talk about the means and standard deviations. So there's your image so you can look back if you don't trust me. And for that matter, I could have gotten the math wrong too. I'm not really the greatest person with math, although I love calculus. The uh, mean for the background was 35.74 counts per minute. The mean for the test was 39.2. Now what I did was I subtracted the background from the background's mean from the test's mean and I came up with a difference of 3.46 counts per minute for the low activity. Now what I did was I divided this by the standard deviations uh, by, well, by the standard deviation for the background which is 1.77426 counts per minute and I discovered that this was 1.9501 counts per minute uh, sorry, 1.9501 standard deviations from the norm. Normally, two standard deviations from the norm would, would yield a positive detection, or, you know, not a, not a great, not a really high confidence detection, but a reasonable one without getting into disease scores and heavy statistics. And I'd like to point out that while I'm reasonably good at calculus, I'm actually not that great at statistics. Statistics and trigonometry are my two weak points in, in math. I mean, I can, you know, do them. I'm not, like, completely ignorant and incapable of, or in, incapable, incapable of doing them. But um, I, I'm not a fan of them. And there are lots of other people out there who are better at them, so you can have fun with that. But I don't call anything that's 1.9501 standard deviations from the norm to be a positive ID. But it is encouraging that it did come out reasonably well. I, I was actually quite impressed. It came pretty close. Now for the 1200 Becquerels per kilogram, much different story there. Let me show you the math up close. So you can like freeze frame if you want to. And I'll put the numbers in the, in the details. So you can just do the math yourself. Because, you know, maybe I did something wrong. Maybe you want to like do some additional research yourself and that's perfectly fine. I hate telling people to do research. I hate when people say that. Whenever somebody says, well, you don't understand something, you need to do more research. No, 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 that's absolutely driving me nuts. This is what's called primary research. This means you actually drive data, right or wrong. Data came out of it, you did it yourself. Um, this is what I call research. I don't call browsing, you know, Google research. This is actual research. Although this is sort of ghetto research, don't get me wrong, but okay. So for the background, I came up with a um, uh, 38.52 counts per minute mean. And for the test, it came out 47.28. Eyeball in that, I'm pretty sure I have a valid detection. But, you know, let's look at the numbers and make sure they're not misleading. Uh, for the background, the standard deviation for the norm is 2.33495. 
Well, the difference between these two, the test, uh, the background subtracted from the test is 8.76 counts per minute. That's 3.7517 standard deviations from the norm. What does that mean? Whoa, my friends. That means uh, detection in anybody's book. So, what have we learned from this little silly ex uh, exercise? We have learned that we can probably confidently say, I mean, I, I'll confidently say that the inspector Geiger counter is capable of detecting, my finger in front of the camera screen, is capable of detecting uh, 1,200 becquerels per kilogram in a homogeneous approximately point source. And that the, the detection time is 10 minutes and the range, the simulated range is 10 centimeters. So, I consider that pretty reasonably accurate. At a simulated range of 10 centimeters for a 10 minute test, um, 370, oops, I got an email, 370 becquerels per kilogram was a little low. I'm not sure I'll count that as an absolute uh, detection. So, the reality is for a, uh, um, um, for a food sample like this, where it's potentially all over the place, that 1,000, or sorry, 1,200 becquerels per kilogram may not be accurate any, anymore. At that point, you might actually require a greater degree, perhaps two or 3,000 becquerels. Of course, I would have to actually simulate that mathematically to figure it out. And I'm already working on a Monte Carlo simulation to do that, actually. But if you had something small like this, I think you could probably detect it. In fact, let's see how many... Um, kilograms this little guy is. Kilograms. Do you have kilograms? Okay, so. This thing's, uh, what is that? A hundred and... Hmm, hundred and seventy. So actually it's hundred and twenty grams. Maybe not, because you need a bunch of these guys put together to equal twelve hundred. Well, the point is you could probably figure it out, and you could probably actually test it. I'd have to sit down and do the math to figure it out myself, but amazing! So what have we learned today? We've learned that the inspector is capable of detecting cesium 137 in food, but only under ideal conditions, and I would call its minimum detection capability somewhere probably, based on these two numbers, somewhere probably in between these two, I'd say maybe 800 to 1,000 becquerels per kilogram for a nearly point source. So you'd have to have like a, a very, very small object. And when you consider that small objects are not usually very dense if they're food, it's actually probably much, much higher than that. So that's not saying that it's super duper great for food contamination purposes. But we know we can't look too far below a thousand becquerels per kilogram. Now, just for giggles, I took this guy and put it at the same distance to simulate the same activities, and um, its automatic identification had some troubles. Um, it has two types. It has one that just plainly tells you the isotope, and that's it. Then it has the other one that actually does the full spectrum accumulation and everything. The spectrum accumulation one was able to actually tell me that there was cesium-137 in this, or in the sample rather, and it did so in under 60 seconds. And it even gave me 6.87 uh, uh, times 10 to the second, plus or minus 2.9 times 10 to the second, um, as an activity, which based on the simulated activity of 1200 becquerels that I was trying to test, was actually half of the activity. So, not bad. This guy, it told me in one minute, and it gave me 50% of the actual activity. And it told me exactly what isotope it was. That's why this can do food testing, whereas that cannot. Um, not bad at all. So, anyhow, this has been Tom from anti-proton.com, and hopefully this didn't bore the hell out of anybody, but, um, bye-bye.